Welcome to this live on dismissive avoidancy. I'm going to be joined by my mate Tyson to talk all about dismissive avoidancy. And this is really going to be a conversation to better understand how avoidant attachment can manifest in a dismissive way rather than simply just a fearful avoidant way. And even though the two obviously have a lot of overlap, they're quite different for in terms of like how they manifest in dating and relationships. And I feel like this would be a good opportunity to also get some questions answered from people who are in the chat who are looking to find out more about dismissive avoidance too. And I am thinking I might do a Q&A separately later in the day as well too for anyone who wants to join. But whilst everyone's coming in, just want to say a big hello and welcome to everyone who's here. Just wanting to wait on Tyson to join the live and then we will take things from there. Ah, there's Tyson. I'll just invite him now. Hopefully Tyson will join very shortly and we can get this live started. Hello everyone who's here. If anyone has a question, feel free to put it into the question box down below and we might get around to it. Hey Tyson, how are you? Hey, good. Can you hear me? I can. I can hear you very well. Okay, good. I'm doing really, really good though. Um, hold on, give me one minute. All good. I'm trying to light this incense right here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. So from what we've discussed, you've identified yourself with dismissive avoidancy. Is that right? Yeah. So for the nature of this live, I was thinking it'd be good just to hear a bit more about how that sort of manifested for you and also how that's shown up in your dating and relationships. How does that sound? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So. I guess my first question is, how did you know that this was even something that you had for yourself? So this was something that happened when I was about 19. So I didn't know that I was doing this, but I learned over time that I had an issue. So this kind of stemmed back from like childhood, right? As it is for like many of us. And in my work, I talk about relationships and spirituality and all those different things and how they interconnect. And so for me, when I was about 12, I started seeing that my dad had a lot of issues when it came to emotional communication. And a lot of the times I felt like I was dismissed a lot as a kid. So it could be something as simple as when I was uh, crying about something, it was kind of like, shut the hell up and be quiet. Or it would sometimes not be any words at all. And it would be completely like nonverbal communication of kind of like, you know, you just know to like settle down and be quiet. And so as I got older, a lot of that stuff from home. And then also when I was in school, because of being gay and being black and, you know, being in a predominantly Christian high school that I did not ask to be in, I was rejected a lot. And so because of all of that, I became very angry. I felt like people were not accepting of me. So when I got into relationships, I basically ended up becoming who my father is still to this day, but I didn't realize that I was doing that. So I attracted a lot of anxious partners, partners who were very clingy, partners who wanted me uh, to basically be like an innocent. And what I mean by that is that these people were people who also had abandonment issues from their own family, but instead of growing up and being coming emotionally avoidant and cutting everybody off and, you know, like just not being emotionally open, they became more like, hey, I need you to like, you know, reaffirm this for me or reassure this for me. And it becomes this thing where it's almost like parent and child, like, you know, I'm dating basically like a kid and you know he's asking for his dad or his mom or somebody in his life it's not always parents it could be coaches it could be you know students at school or whatever for this like love and this attention and these different things and when they don't get that sometimes some of them depending on who the anxious person is they can tend to feel like well you know it's doomsday for me in relationships and i'll never you know um you know be loved or whatever and for the avoidant it's more so like I can do it all on my own. I don't need anybody. Like, I'm not going to open up to you because, you know, a lot of us did not grow up in homes where there was emotional openness. So that's kind of how I got started. Yeah. Long winded, but yeah. 
That's, I was going to say, that's a very effective way of describing what happened. I mean, mm -hmm. I can totally resonate with that based on all the research that I've done into this and also with what some of my clients have said as well too. And I definitely say that whilst I've had a history of being maybe a bit more anxious leaning, I definitely am no stranger to avoidancy from time to time. But I think what I find really interesting about what you described with your childhood was how growing up, it was it just sounded like it was neglectful like it sounds like emotions were repressed and suppressed and when it came to dating it's interesting how you know for you tyson you've had a lot of partners who just needed that reassurance from you that everything was okay from your experience like when i think of like someone who's you know let's just say on the anxious attachment sort of spectrum usually that can be a huge you know space because there's some people who they're mildly anxious and they're just like hey babe i just want to know if everything's okay and then there are some people who are really controlling and demanding of yeah. your time, energy, and resources. What would you, how would you describe some of the partners that you were dating in terms of their behavior? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, I'll focus on two because there's been clearly more than two. Um, but the first, first one, he was not as anxious as the person I was just recently with. Um, he was a little bit more like, I, I need you to give me like approval online. So like if I post something, you know, like comment, you know, under my post, if I'm calling you and I need you to be somewhere at a certain time, like, you know, please show up. Um, sometimes it was here and there, like if I had spent maybe two days out of the week with him and he wanted to see each other on the weekend or whatever, and I was kind of like, I need like, you know, a little bit of my space or whatever. I just need like to focus on different things. He would kind of get, you know, a little bugged out, but he wasn't as bad. Um, the second one was a little bit more intense. He was more, um, he was more like, I just need a lot of reassurance. He would feel like if I was to walk into a room and I wasn't to say anything to him, but he kind of maybe felt like I was off and maybe I was doing completely fine. I just felt like being quiet. He would kind of internalize that and make that something bigger than, you know, what it actually was when it was really just like, you know, I'm just cool. I'm good. I'm whatever. Now, granted with me, I did have moments at that time because I just did not know how to regulate my own emotions. So I was very much like one minute, you know, I would be like, good and it would be great and then like maybe something would overstimulate me whether it was something happening at home or something happening in just different areas of my life i would start to feel like oh my goodness you know i just needed to cut him off and then everything would be fine so it would be like he was kind of like my i guess resort to being like he's the first thing i can get rid of because it's just too much um, but i was doing that unconsciously and so i didn't know that that's what was happening but i feel like from those situations, from the second guy, I definitely learned a lot more because he taught me that there was a lot of problems that I had emotionally. I didn't know how to process my own emotions. And he was one of those that his emotions were right off the sleeve. He would say stuff that was like, just easy. It was easy for him to express his emotions. For me, it was not like that. For me, with me, I was very like, I'm not gonna explain like anything i'm not gonna say anything like i just was very uncomfortable with vulnerability and it was mainly because a lot of the times growing up i voiced my I was, i'm a very sensitive person but i was a very sensitive kid and i explained things to both of my parents at various different times and my dad specifically just because i spent a lot more time with him a lot of his own um responses to things were very neglectful um, but also when i was again in school like it's not even just him or parents or family a lot of the times you're spending time in these environments where you know back then if you are you know um gay or whatever you know people just don't really you know fuck with you like that and so a lot of my avoidance when i was in relationships just came from all of that combined so that that's what I would say. I don't, they, they weren't bad people, but I think that sometimes, depending on the extreme of your anxiousness, it could become like, like you're almost depending on a person to help you feel better in a sense about yourself. And part of the thing that I had with the second person was he would get upset about something. And instead of like just saying he was upset, 
he would get he would he wouldn't understand space sometimes if there was an argument going on he would want to fix it now fix it now he would mention to me he doesn't want the yeah. same things happening that what happened with his parents and and um it would just be this whole thing but i don't think he understood that a lot of his own uh, pressure and like i need this person or i need to do anything to just keep this person in my life whether we stay friends whether we just like follow each other online whether we um you know just like have each other's phone numbers to be able to text like i feel like it, it was almost it felt like desperateness to me like i'm gonna do anything just to just keep this person around and i just felt bad a lot of the times because i was like i don't want this person to like feel horrible about you know they're never gonna get a relationship because they're too anxious or whatever it, it just made me feel like bad but i had to walk away from it at the same time because you can't hold on to that no and look based on what you described and you did an excellent like you did an amazing job of just describing like that spectrum of like you mm -hmm. know just behavior from the couple of guys that you dated because i think already that paints a pretty good picture for me at least in terms of like you know their own patterns and wounding that obviously is for them to work on but i think also gives a good illustration of you know how these avoidant anxious pairings can occur quite readily too because like i mean for me i've never really dated you know men who are quite frankly that anxious in the first place i'll be honest like i've mostly dated avoidant partners and so i think it's interesting how sometimes vicariously i don't know what it is like if it's a law of attraction or it's just you know trauma talking but i do find it interesting how you know our background and also the way we manifest with our attachments sometimes seems to cause us to be more gravitated towards you know the other attachment styles so it's interesting you mentioned that because I know for me, my dating history has mostly been men with like very dismissive avoidant patterns and tendencies as well too. And I've gotten better over time of like figuring out like I, as soon as I know like what I'm into, I'm like, ah, I know what this is and I know how to sort of like yeah. navigate this. But I will say that I think that um, especially for our community as gay men, especially for people of colour too from different like communities, I feel like because of the trauma there, there is a greater likelihood for us to manifest with like severe anxious or severe avoidancy, depending on like, you know, your origin story, so to speak. So I think what you're saying is incredibly consistent. One thing you said that I wanted to circle back on was how like when you were under a lot of stress, the easy thing to like eliminate was your partner <laughs> yeah. and to get rid of them. For me, I can't even begin to think of like, for me, like that's a thought that would never come into my mind. Like my thought would be mm. simply like, oh, you know, if for instance, something's, you know, I'm going through a lot of stress, I might be like to my partner, hey, babe, I just need a minute. I need to actually just like focus on some stuff and then I'll get back to you. It mm -hmm. sounds like it's different for someone with more of an avoidant attachment style. Can you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, again, it comes from like, you know, growing up and, and what you experienced growing up. But I think with me, it just went back to, I didn't know how to process my emotions. So vulnerability to me, I had had a point in my life where I was like, I want to open myself up to be more um, emotionally vulnerable. And this happened in like 2021. I met him in September of that year. And I had this like epiphany in like the springtime, I think summertime of that year. Um, and I was doing a lot of inner child work at the time. And so that's why I wanted to open up to being more emotionally, you know, vulnerable. But the thing is, is what came with that was once I met him, because he had already kind of been doing a lot of that work himself. Um, he was much more open than than me in certain things. So when when emotions really got real, when it was like, you know, something he did that affected me and i just would be like i didn't want to talk about it or if it was like you know we got into an argument and i just started you know saying like um you know i don't know like i don't have to be here or like or like i think i used to say like you don't have to be here or whatever it is yeah um and I'm, or i'm not asking you to do those things like you're you're doing it because of your own thing or i would throw out a lot of times that he was insecure about a lot of stuff um and so a lot of i think what a lot of dismissive avoidance do is they actually tend to um some of them not all of them i can only speak from my personal experience but i was very insecure within my own uh, emotional vulnerableness so a lot of the times with those two guys and then with multiple other partners i would pin them i would like blame them for their own sensitivities and their own like you know problems and it was a lot of the times because that's what was done to me 
So I was a mm. really anxious person in my own upbringing. I was crying. I was like, I need this, I need that. And then I would go into a relationship and I would do the same thing to them. And didn't notice that I was doing those things. Um, so I think when it comes to an avoidant person, like kind of getting rid of like their partner very easily, it's mostly because they don't know how to really be in touch with themselves. And so it, it's, it's so easy to be kind of like independent because I, for me, I grew up with very um, achievement parents, you know, independent parents. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I have like degrees and accolades and all of that stuff, but I didn't know what was going on inside of my body. So I felt like I was pretty much like a bobbling head and it was like I had no body. That's what it felt like to me. Most of my life, I, I literally felt like I had, like from the neck down was nothing. Like I felt nothing I'd, because I was pretty much like a performance child. And so when you get love from like football, basketball, track and having all these different degrees and all this stuff and all this money and cars, and whatever, you don't really notice that you have no sense of self. So you don't love yourself. You don't have any value. You, you don't care about like love. Most of it for me was the image. Like I just liked a guy who was pretty cute, you know, like we had a good time, went on vacation, had sex or whatever. And then that was it. When it came to like real emotions and then actually expressing stuff, I would feel like, oh, like, don't do that. Like, like I would just get completely like, why are we doing this? Um, so it takes a lot of like, you know, you gotta be able to like see through the bullshit of what you're doing. Um, because if you don't, then yeah, you do repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, you just have to be self-aware. You actually have to want help too, because I realized I, I honestly ruined, I think a lot of relationships because I was so mean, like they would multiply, like a lot of them would say to me, um, it feels like you don't even like me. And like, I, I didn't even understand what that meant. But, and I would hear, I heard that at least like three times, three different men and three different experiences. So I knew it was time to like change something. So, yeah. Well, more credit to you, because from what I understand, <laughs> a lot of avoidant attachers don't do that at all. Oh, like, no. I mean, yeah, no, they don't. No. Because I was going to say, like, from what I understand, and I mean, even to what you were saying too, so much easier. And by the way, I'm not saying this as a place, as a, out of a place of criticism to you, but it seems like when someone's heavy in their avoidant attachment, <laughs> so much easier to just blame the other person for their sensitivities, their neediness, their clinginess, their anxious attachment, rather than to be like, I'm getting a lot of consistent feedback here and maybe there's something that I need to work on too. So yeah. it's amazing. But you know, that's the other thing too, Tyson, is like, um, cause obviously I've known you for a few years now and like, yeah. it's interesting because I think there's like a level of self-awareness one can have, but then to be so aware of like your attachment playing out unconsciously, that is like a next level of awareness that I think a lot of people aren't even prepared for too. And I know that for some avoidant attachers who I've worked with, sometimes I'll say they're like, yeah, I knew I had a problem, but I just didn't want to address it. Like I knew that there was something going yeah. on inside of me, but it was so much easier to quite ironically to avoid my avoidant attachment style. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think most people who have avoided attachments don't know that that's what's going on with them. A lot of it is you're raised with it. And I mean, this is just what it is. You know, you see people who like go through, you know, their whole life like that. And I mean, in my situation, you know, I had personal things with like my mom and, and my dad and, and um, some personal stuff that my mom told me that I saw play out in my childhood exactly you know things that she explained and then you get older and you watch the dynamic of what's going on around you and you're like this shit doesn't make any sense um and it's not right and so it's it's part of the thing that i had to really ask myself like what is it that i want i went to my um my sister's house uh what was it sunday and i was talking to her about how i've been reading um this book called the, um the five love languages and I was just like, I want to find a new book, you know, to read. And she put me onto that book and she was like, you know, um, let's go ahead and like, you know, start reading it or whatever. And so I've been doing that. But one of the things that she was saying is she was like, you know, she loves love and all these different things, 
But I was sitting to myself and I was like, well, why would I care about like what my partner cares about? Like, it, because I was, I was in a space where I was so independent on like, if there's love that I need to give, I need to give it to myself. You know, like I don't need to give it to like somebody else or like, mm -hmm. you know, I, that person needs to work on it for themselves. Like it was very like independently speaking um, and not from a place of like, oh, you should have like a tender heart and care for them. Oh shit. No, it's okay. We're just and, so oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I hope oh, this phone doesn't get hot. But yeah, I just didn't care. And I think that's really what it was at the end of the day. Um, and now I'm doing my best to like, you know, get better. And, and I don't want to be in any type of relationship until not, I'm not going to be perfect, but at least until I feel that I'm able to, to be that for real, to be open, to be more, I feel more secure in myself, but it's also challenging and it can be triggering when you have an actual person in your life. Um, so, but yeah, no, being aware is something that it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of you wanting to a lot of people run with a lot of pride and ego and people think that they don't they can't change or they don't want to change and they live from a space of blaming other people for why they are the way they are um or they they live in this very egotistical you know mentality because the brain essentially doesn't ever want us to change and so it's like when you are really tested to do that especially when somebody's talking about your character when someone says hey, you know, there's something that you're doing wrong, you know, um, or hey, the way you speak is a problem. Um, some people will be like, oh, okay, and they'll play like these petty games with you. Um, yeah. And it's like, you have to just get to a point to where you're serious enough to like want to do better for you. Because people who act like that end up alone. Um, and, you know, you can be in a marriage but you can be completely alone. You know, I, I've seen it in my own life and it's like, when I see a lot of people going down the hill that I have learned to leave, it's just like, you know, some people you can say that, oh, they don't know any better. I don't believe in that. I believe that people have intuition. I believe people are not, you know, born to be assholes. I think that people are, people have an instinctive knowing that they're doing something wrong or that they're treating someone wrong and they just choose not to change. So therefore there is no feeling bad because I used to be there. So the, the, if, if I was there being mean and shitty to people, I mean, people can change too. Yeah, 100 billion percent agreed. And I've got a lot to say to that. I think with the point about the brain doesn't want us to change, I definitely know I can speak from my own anecdotal experience so much easier to just have that ego mind running amok where it's telling you things, you know, just justifying the way that you behave and never really questioning anything like, yeah, but why do I think that? And why do I believe this is the way it is? And then added to that too, I know for a lot of avoidant attachers, particularly ones that I work with, I take my time with them because it's, I find interestingly, like, I don't know if you've had this experience in dating and relationships, Tyson, but I know a lot of avoidant attachers often barrel in to new dating and relationships, like often that honeymoon phase, they're like super intense and really into you and yeah. it can be love bomby. And I understand why they do that because to your point, if you're hyper independent and your body's like craving connection, then you naturally would seek out the very thing that you've been depriving yourself of for a long time, like someone who's been, you know, denied water and hydration. And then of course you're thirsty, but the minute you drink water, you're like, I'm not used to this. I don't feel like this is good for me at all. So I can understand how it's very complicated for a lot of avoidant attaches in dating and relationships because they're both, they're getting that connection that they need, but they're also not prepared for it. And I know for a fact that with my clients, some avoid, I'm no stranger to having avoidant attaches just cut and run from me sometimes <laughs> yeah. as a clinician because I find a lot of them are like, oh, let's just get on with this. I want to work on myself right now. And I'm like, you really need to slow down because your same desire to work on this will also be matched by an anxiety to cut and run because yeah. you're not prepared for what it is to actually have that's, you know, I don't say I'm a secure base, but I'm definitely more secure than I've been before. Like, you know, you're not ready for that, uh, that modeling yet because you have to ease yourself into it. It's like exposure therapy. If you're not used to being with someone in that particular way, it's just gonna cause you to freak out. Is that something that you resonate based on your journey as well too in dating and relationships? Yeah, I 
think so because I mean I was definitely freaked out when um, I started learning about this avoidance stuff. I mean, I went from like watching videos, I went to therapy, I did all of that. But really, I mean, the work really started when I actually started to be like, what are the things that you do and say that are fucked up? And like, you, know, you know, and I feel like that's really where it started. A lot of people who have, like, again, this, you know, they do want to jump into it. And I was the same way. I wanted to quickly, like, get into it. I wanted to do it. I wanted to, um, I wanted to be like healed. I wanted to get it over and done with. I wanted to be like 100% great and good and, you know, no problems. But it doesn't work like that. No. Um, some people who naturally just have those emotions that flow out, they just do. And there's others like me who have to, you know, go a little longer and, and, and take your time. Um, and, you know, it's not the easiest thing. I mean, I still question. Oh my God, this thing. I still question to myself, um, you know, like, how am I going to start caring for a person's needs in there? Because I can do this with my friends. I can do this with my family. I can do this with people that I work with. Like, it's, it's easy to do that. But when it comes down to like your partner, or for some reason, that was a harder thing for me. But it was also because, I mean, I didn't see that in my home. Like, there was no like, you know, holding my wife and dancing in the kitchen there was no you know this is how you treat a woman or this is how you you know like there was none of that and i think that because of that you know um it, it's a di different experience and, and you don't know how to how to do it and so i think a lot of the times it, it is easy for avoidant attachments to love the honeymoon phase it's a beautiful thing to to, to have but then when it is kind of over and there is more real realer situations but like I've noticed like all my relationships have been a year and a half I've never got past that and I don't know really what that is it seems like a year and a half things just start to just kind of disconnect and you know whatever but I do think that a lot of the times these men are men that they loved me a lot more than I like loved them or they cared for me more than I cared for them I think I was definitely on like a half and half basis it's like, if you did something that I was cool with, then I'm great with that. But if not, like, if you're too overbearing or too much, you know, it's like, it, I didn't understand that them being too much was really like just explaining their own emotions and just expressing them. So I had this thing where anytime they would tell me like, hey, you know, I just feel like you're doing this, I would get completely into like defense mode. I would start defending like myself instead of allowing them to just like explain what they're feeling. It would be more of like a you're not going to tell me that, that, that i would be ready to attack them and that came from childhood as well because i always felt like it wasn't good enough so anytime that somebody would you know or a partner would come to me with their own anxious whatever i would feel like i'm now having to you know buckle up and fight um, and not learning to like really like love them from what um from, from what they're expressing and what they're explaining. And so I'm always the type of person that when something is really, really wrong, you know, I'll pay for coaching or I'll pay for a course or I'll get a book or whatever, whatever I feel led to, um, to, you know, help myself. But really outside of all of that stuff, you know, you have to just start to be honest with yourself and, and be open um, with you because if you don't, then you'll just keep repeating the same shit. Um, over and over again. And I think that when you have, especially romantic partners telling you the same thing over and over again, it's like you really need to look at yourself. Yeah. I completely agree. One thing that you actually said there, which was really interesting, was how the sensitivities of your partner almost it sounded like you got the ick from them as well, too. Like there were moments yes. where when they were at their neediest, that was almost when you were like, I am not as invested in this as I once was. And one thing that I know is a constant rumination for many people, regardless of whether they're anxious or even secure when they've dated someone with severe avoidancy, is the question, did this person ever love me or did I make this up? And I was wondering... And they get really depressed too. But go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, because like, I mean, I know for many people, they, they really question like, was I making this all up? Like, because it feels a bit like gaslighting for many people because they feel yeah. like... 
you know, oh, like I feel as though this entire experience was made up. And the thing that I always tell my clients and people that I work with is I'm like, I, as someone who has dated people where I have genuinely not been interested in people and I have been interested in people, the distinction is quite clear. Like when you're not invested in someone personally, I find that I'm just like, I'm not interested in them from day one. And it, that feeling doesn't grow and change on day 30. It's often just like, I'm kind of bored and I'm just like, you're a nice person who ticks all the boxes, but I'm not really enjoying this experience. Yeah. Versus what I found, like if you're genuinely into someone, you can feel it. And I mean, that's me speaking from someone, like I said, who's a bit more secure slash anxious leaning. But for you, you know, Tyson, what are your thoughts on this for from your dating experience too? Because I'm wondering if, you know, it's similar or you genuinely never cared for these guys at all. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> I think that there's a part of something that I can own up to, the different parts of my relationship where, or relationships where I definitely did not show from an outside perspective that I cared, like from their view, you know, so through the words that I would say, or, you know, the very unconscious behaviors that I would behave in. So I can definitely say that. But I do feel like when, when it comes to myself personally, because I can only speak for me, I feel like I have definitely cared because I feel like I stuck out a lot of times when I was kind of feeling emotionally drained because I wanted to understand them better and I wanted to learn. The thing with me was when it started to feel like they were asking so much of me instead of really asking themselves questions of why they're reacting the way that they are to things. Like if, for example, if a, one of the guys that I dated, he was like very insecure about his notion of knowing that we were good that like we were together and that we were actually really good like we were fine like you know i would reassure him a lot and i would try to help him out a lot but it seemed like for some reason he wouldn't believe that we were good so it's kind of like i felt like he wasn't really assuring himself a lot that like okay like you know tyson likes me tyson wants to be around me tyson like cares about me i feel like he would constantly question like does tyson really like me the way that he says that he does and so I feel like at that point, it's like, if you're not really watching my actions, because sometimes I'm not always going to say it through words, you know, sometimes I'm going to give you gifts or sometimes I'm going to write letters or whatever, you know, it's not going to always come out of my voice. So it's just one of those things that to me, it got to a point to where I was like, okay, I can't keep staying in something that I feel like you don't really believe, you know, in yourself as much as I am telling you about the situation. So I think a lot of times people got to ask themselves questions, but I can definitely say that I was the fault in, in uh, many problems um, and why situations didn't really work the way that they probably could have. Um, but that was just on me. Yeah. And I mean, I would say like, it's really good hearing that insight because I think that would probably be quite reassuring for a lot of people to hear too, because it doesn't sound to me like you got into these relationships looking to like, you know, fool the partner that you're with being like surprise i never cared about you at all i'm off now to the next person to be with because typically what we see and like when we're looking at it from an outsider's point of view an avoidant attacher who's quite severe in their avoidancy will you know be love bombing someone getting really into them and it doesn't matter for how long whether it be a month or two years for instance when intimacy starts to build up and that abrupt ending happens there's often obviously the shock the confusion that did this person ever love me at all and then for people who are quite severe in their avoidancy, moving straight into a new relationship. And to the outsider, they're like, I feel like this person played me. I feel like, you know, this person just never really cared about me at all. And based on what you're saying, of course, I know that you're only one person on planet Earth, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't sound to me like you were going into these experiences looking to fuck with people. It was very much a case of just like, oh no, like, you know, my feelings were sort of just like erratic depending on my partner's behavior. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I think if you're just going into situations and then like two or three months and you're just like, okay, bye, I never really cared about you. I think you're just a narcissist at that point or you're some type of like psycho psychomaniac, something like yeah, there's something like that's wrong. Like you have a mental, you know, you like to fuck with people for some reason. Um, for me, I, I was not, I, I was just based off of, are you going to be emotionally draining me? Um, am I going to feel like I'm being, you know, dragged down. I didn't like that feeling. So once I felt like that, it was just kind of like, okay, this is no longer my, you know, responsibility.
responsibility because I have my own life. I have my own everyday routine and I need someone who is going to sure it's okay if sometimes you're a little bit down, but if I feel like I have to stop everything every time to try to get your emotions together. And meanwhile, I feel like I'm being disregarded or not heard, then yes, I'm going to leave. <laughs> um, now I think dismissive wise, um, you know, whether when I was cutting off guys and they were explaining something to me, um, or when they really, really wanted something and I just was not listening to them a lot. I think that's the thing that, you know, kind of caused me to be very avoidant. But I feel like when you, when you're just playing mean, it just like that, that's just a totally different situation. But I will say one thing I have noticed about myself, and this is something that I uh, recently went through. When I left my relationship, um, I became very like anxious towards not necessarily wanting another relationship, but I did want like other partners. And part of the reason of that is because in my relationship, my sex life wasn't the best. Um, and a lot of other things were, you know, kind of problems. And I kind of, I stuck with him and I don't cheat and do any of that stuff. So I stayed with him because I wanted to work it out. I wanted to talk about things. I wanted to move through things. I wanted to, you know, not, um, leave that relationship however i felt like my needs were not getting met in some areas and you know i had to talk with him before i left but um there was a lot of things that i just was not willing to continue to keep you know staying in and of course he was thinking that i was going to go and like date someone new and have a new partner i don't have anybody but i will say that being anxious in the sense of like i felt like i needed 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 another person to touch to feel to you know be around or whatever um until i kind of learned like being still is fine being with yourself being okay is fine um yeah. and i think the thing is is that avoidant attachments can become anxious in different situations um but i will say that i do think that in some anxious people just the experience that i've had with certain men they can cling on so much i mean to the point to where they're like depressed and they don't want to eat and they don't want and i think when it gets to that point you kind of got to ask yourself like or they start creating fantasies around the person that isn't really real um and it's one of those things where it's like you kind of ask yourself like do you have a sense of self-respect because if you respected yourself you wouldn't put somebody else and create this whole world around this one person um or give so much attention to this person when it's like you have your own sense of self or you should and if you don't like you need to reassess yourself because if you are putting all of this power and this this you know importance you know on somebody else it's like well then you have no sense of self you don't respect yourself you'll stay up all night and wait for this person to you know message you um because you have no sense of self so that's something that I had to recognize too, because I was anxious in different ways. Yeah. And look, that's incredibly consistent with what I've heard as well, Tyson. Like, I think that, you know, what you described makes a great deal of sense in terms of like how you navigated relationship, post relationship experience and navigating that. And I mean, more power to you for being single right now, because I know the struggle is very real <laughs> for a lot of people who have avoidant attachment post relationship ending because they can look really cold and very indifferent to the ending where it does make the receiver feel like this person never cared about me but that's no we're down. actually very sad i mean we when, when breakups happen i mean i can't speak for everybody else because like i said there are people who are just narcissists but for myself i mean i was i did not want to leave i mean i wanted to stay i wanted to work things out but again i had to think about myself and a lot of times i did say a lot of times that i was planning certain things for myself and and all of that because i was staying in a home that, that you know was very it was a lot going on i graduated from school i came back i didn't have a job um and i was you know not getting callbacks and there's a lot of different things that were going on my life was changing and and i was still trying to stay in a relationship at the same time um and so you're like trying to figure out your personal life and your own family stuff and then a, and then another person. But I realized that um, when I left the relationship, I didn't want to. I felt very sad, but, and I still do miss the person, but I, but I don't miss feeling drained. And I feel like for me, I can still 
still be kind to you. I can still be cool with you, but you have to be responsible for your own healing as well. And I, I've noticed that in almost every relationship that I've been in, I have been the one that either has been like helping the person who was, I've dated two people that were avoidance. Um, and it was like, I was more of the like emotions off my sleeve. Like, let me, you know, help you with this and help you with that. And then with the anxious partners, it's like, let me pull you out of this heavy emotion that you're going to stick yourself into all day long. And it's one of those things where it's like, you got to either be where I am or higher. It's like actually higher than me, not just where I am. Because at some point, you know, you have to look at, hey, you know, I got triggered by something that he said. I need to like figure out where that comes from. And then I need to be able to approach this situation or come to him or go to yourself and just say, okay, well, this comes from that, that comes from this. And this is why I did that. A lot of anxious people, people in general, whether you're anxious or avoided, you know, they blame people for, for things. They yell at their partner, you did this and you did that and you did this and you did that. And not noticing that you're not yelling at your partner. You're yelling at something that happened to you years ago. And now you're having an effect from, you know, I had a time where um, I was mad at my part. I was uncomfortable with my partner because of the way he didn't really introduce me to his friends. And I used to like, intro I introduced him to my friends first on FaceTime and then in, in person. And I felt some kind of way because I was like, you know, we were going somewhere and his friend just hopped up, you know, out of the house. I didn't even know where we were. We were in like his neighborhood or somewhere by his neighborhood. And basically we just ended up, you know, picking up his friend and I was really upset about that. And I didn't voice my opinion on it because I didn't know how to at the time. Uh, but basically what ended up happening was I had to tell him that um, I had to tell him that I had an experience that happened, you know, a couple years ago around this time. And um, it was the same type of thing. I went on a trip with a guy. I hadn't met his friends yet, his high school friends. And I only was hanging out with him. And when we went on this cabin trip, I was basically all by myself because I didn't know these people. I obviously am very talkative. I tried to get, you know, to talking to everybody, but I felt very uncomfortable. So pretty much what I realized was I carried that situation with me from years ago to the present moment. And I was upset about that. And so I started to not voice what was going on with me um, because I'd be one of those people that I'd be quiet when I'm upset. And it's like my anger or whatever just radiates out to like everybody else so people can feel it. And I don't say anything. And so it was one of those things where it's like I had to learn how to like start expressing like, okay, what are some what are some things that you would like for your partner to do? But one of them is introduce me to their friends and have a dinner or get to know them before we go on these vacations and these trips or concerts or whatever it's going to be. Um, but that's something that, you know, I had to learn from the experience. Because I would never have done that if I didn't know. <laughs> so, yeah. But a lot of that stuff comes from other things is what I'm saying. People get anxious about their partners and they, they, they oh, my God, I don't know if my partner is really going to like me. And it's probably because you, like, got rejected when you were in sixth grade. Or, you know, like, you know, your parents didn't, you know, they abandoned you in some ways, you know, emotionally, maybe even physically, you know, and you haven't, like, worked on that. Um, and now you're expecting a partner like to do that. And I notice a lot of anxious partners, they expect uh, a, a partner to almost like be their parent or be like their God or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, you're not going to get that. Like, and I, I, t I would tell him all the time, like, if you do this with me, you're going to do this with like 15 other people that you meet. Like, it's going to be the same thing until you learn to change it. Um, and, and I just think that it, it kind of felt a little bit like some guilt if I was to like leave the relationship I felt really bad if because he cared about me so much and I could tell he was attached to me so much and to this whole ideal of the relationship that when it didn't happen it's like his whole world shattered and I'm like if your whole world is breaking down because of one human being you won't be able to like last in life like how are you gonna you know operate when you're whole you know so um that that was a big thing uh but you know, everybody, you know, is, is different, but I think it just, you know, I think for avoidance, I think you got to get to a point to where you are at least willing to try to work on why you are the way you are, because I 
feel like I don't believe that anxious anxious people or anxious attachments are bad people or that it's something that we need to stay away from. I think it's just when you are uneducated about your own shit uh, um, and you, you know, are surrounded by it or whatever, it just takes time to get to like heal that. And I feel like when you spend a lot of time with yourself and you start looking at your romantic life, because I don't feel like I was ever like in love with any of them. I, I liked them. I enjoyed their company. I have love. I love them. I have love for them. But was I really in it? No. I was kind of like, you're cute. I'm cute. This is cool. You know, you got spiritual beliefs that match with mine. You know, you, you, you dress nice. I dress nice. You know, we, we're, we're healing and growing together. But really, when it really came down to them expressing something, it was like, bye. Like, I don't want to. That's weird. You know? <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I'm hearing is, it's not a case I think of like, did you ever love them? It's more of a case of like, you weren't at that next level with a lot of these people too, and they probably weren't with you either. Because it's sort of like, you know, in the honeymoon phase with your partners, you know, I'm not doubting your connection and attraction for yeah. each other, but it's like when shit got real and you both had to work past a lot of your own stuff that was coming up, whether it be his anxiousness or your avoidancy, that's where you both were at loggerheads with one another and that emotional connection was starting to be impaired from the sounds of it. So I can understand that. When this, by the way, there's a user who's just asked, not in love after a year and a half. Yeah. I, I my to respond to that. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to respond to that one? Well, one, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, after a year and a half, you know, I, I think that I think there's a difference between being in love as you actually being in love where you are able to move through everything. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Regardless of anything that's going on. And then there's a difference between being in love with the fantasy of what it could have, of what it is. Sometimes when you're in, when you are, you know, in love, Sometimes you're in love with a version of who you think this person should be or could have been or whatever, versus being in love with, I loved this experience and I loved what you taught me. I loved what I learned here. What am I in love with you? I can say I was in love to a certain degree because I still love him regardless of his own issues and his own problems. But I think being in love is when I think you have two people who are able to I don't know, like go through their own situations like together, but also being able to understand them separately because in love to me is not just being with that person or just the core relationship of that, you know, unit. I think in loveness is actually happening while you guys are working on your own situations and being together at the Correct. same time. Yeah. That's I, I think I too think. many people look at it as like, I'm in love with this person and the relationship that we're together but you don't understand like you might something is like off you know and if the avoidant person is too avoidant the, the, the anxious person is too anxious i just think that there's problems in every relationship but i don't want to be in love with somebody or i don't want to say that i'm in love with someone because i'm just trying to like lift them up all the time and help them to the next level of their life. I think you can be in love with what you had and with what experiences you learned from it and then move forward because there's every relationship you can be in love with something or with that person's characters or qualities in some type of way. I don't think in love always needs to either lead to marriage. Um, and I just recently learned this. Every partner that I meet now is just an experience. I think people and even myself put way too much pressure on what the next guy, the next guy. And it's like, I've had experiences even lately just going on dates or even like hookup situations where I would go and I'm just, have, I'm just, we're going out to dinner. We have a good time. We, sometimes we did stuff, sometimes we did it. And it was just an experience. There's nothing that really needs to come from that. Um, but if you're in the space of a relationship, I do believe that, you know, you can be in love with a person and not necessarily have lasted with them. I think that my year and a half situations have been, you know, amazing and they've been wonderful. But I've known also that I had shit that I had to work on, 
but I also know that there were things that that person was dealing with that I wasn't going to continue to, you know, put myself, you know, there at the expense of my own energy being drained. And that's just, you know, where I'm at, you know, with that. Yeah. Because, some, because that same person, she said, um, but after a year and a half, I can't imagine myself ever staying that long if I wasn't, if it wasn't love for me. I think that I stayed that long because it was love for me. And when I decided to, and I wanted the betterment for that man. So it had nothing to do with necessarily the, you know, like romantic love. Like when I yeah. am interested in you, I love you as a person. I love you as a, because I don't see you as a boyfriend. I see you as someone who is a human being, who is growing, who has experienced triggers, traumas, and, you know, all different types of stuff. So when you leave, when we, you know, depart, I want you to be somebody who is able to grow and who is able to learn on, you know, throughout life. Like I'm here to help you to do that if you want my help. But at some point I can't keep helping you. You have to help yourself. And I think that if you are in a relationship where it is evolving, where like you don't feel like I have to keep helping you. I have to keep showing you how to shift your mind and do all these things. You have to practice that at some point. I can't hold your hand for the rest of my life, you know. Um, and I think that we meet people like that to, to be able to learn and to be able to be with them. And again, like, I, I don't talk, I can't talk shit about any of my partners. I've always, I always say, I've always attracted and I always will attract amazing, fantastic men. I always do. It always happens emotionally, mentally, spiritually. It's, it's a beautiful experience with all of them, whether I was in a relationship with them or not. But there are certain things that, you know, as a person, you have the ability to, you know, learn for yourself. So they are blowing it up on you. <laughs> yeah, that made sense to me. And it was yeah. a really new breakdown of what love can be. Because I think a lot of us, I'll be honest, I definitely have felt the, you know, romanticized love with someone. Yeah. And, you know, I think that deeper layer of love is something that is worked on over time. And it's not always, and to be honest, it's not something that you find on day dot one where you're just getting to know someone. I think honeymoon phase transitioning into real genuine love is, it's a work in progress. And to your point about anxious um, and avoidant pairings, I think what you said is so accurate in that the severely anxious needs to learn to self-regulate and become more independent and also to take care of themselves. But it's the avoidant person's job to become more inclusive of how they're thinking and feeling. Like going back to what you were saying with that example you shared earlier about how you're in the car, you're stewing in that anger and you were saying like, I didn't have, like it was just radiating off you. That's, you know, for many avoidance, the opportunity to be like, okay, I think I'm having this emotion. I need to let you know how I'm feeling because I don't want to feel this way going forward because maybe it's a boundary violation, whatever it may be. But well, we also don't like to be rejected either. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I've heard that for many avoidant attachments, that whole thing of expressing feelings, there's a real risk of rejection for them in terms of how they're thinking about it. Because many, because for me, I mean, I mean, I started this when I was a kid. I mean, I was very, very, I was very, um, I was very, very sensitive as a kid. I mean, I told my people exactly what it is that I needed to tell them. And I just was very, very, very vocal. And a lot of the times, because I was so vocal, I was, I was shut down because I was willing to be vulnerable and willing to be open. And so for many, it was kind of like a threat to them because I had pretty avoidant emotional parents. And so for their own sake of whatever, you know, it was too much for them, whatever it was, it was like, you have to, you know, stop doing that. And so as I got into relationships, it wasn't normal for me to have a person who was so uh, emotionally open. And the funny thing is what I found attracted to a lot of more, when I say flamboyant, or not flamboyant, but feminine men, were men who were more, more open with expressing their emotions. I loved learning about that. And I thought that was interesting. But when they started to do it and it was too much, I was like, oh yeah, you gotta stop. And so I think for me, it became more about, you know, how do I kind of stop this rather than like, and run away from this rather than like approach it. I didn't know that that was a trigger for me to like respond and actually open up my emotions because yeah. we're not taught in society to 
hey, when someone's expressing their emotions, it's a place of vulnerability. You should open up yours and, re and be receptive of what they're saying. Some people just, they common sense have that and it just works. I think a lot of the times for me, yeah. because I did so much of that in multiple areas of my life and I was rejected, I repressed a lot of that. So I didn't know how to like let out anger when I was angry. I didn't know how to you know, cry and you know, bawl my eyes out. Like I didn't understand that. Even when I started understanding the um, the concept of like emotions being trapped in the body and having like certain muscle pains and going through that, those were all like symptoms of not emotionally being open. So I didn't know that. So it's like, you know, you just kind of just don't know what you don't know at the time. Um, yeah. But yeah. But I mean, that doesn't make an excuse because when I was doing that, I knew that I was wrong and I'd apologize and, you know, and then you go and do the same thing again. Um, because most of it is, you know, unconscious anyway. Yep, hundred billion percent. Completely agree with everything you said. I was going to say, um, just to round out, um, I know we've gone actually longer than I thought we would, and I've loved every minute of this, Tyson. Mm. I was going to ask, do you have a spare ten minutes if we just did like a quick um, Q and A off some of the questions? Yeah. We've so I was thinking I might read out some of the questions that we've got here and just get your insights on them, and we can just do this to wrap up. How does that sound? That's good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So some people have asked some really good questions. And if anyone, by the way, has some questions, throw them into the question box below because sometimes it's a bit tricky for me to scroll through and just summarize them for everyone. But I figured I'd start with the first one I got here for you, Tyson. So um, and uh, bear in mind, everyone, Tyson's one man with avoidant attachment. He doesn't represent the entire <laughs> community of avoidant attaches. So don't you know, attack me. <laughs> yeah. Please don't assume he's like your ex, your boyfriend, your girlfriend dealing with right now so oh my god i talk about this stuff on my tiktok right and my tiktok is the same as my instagram and people like they some of them not everybody but some people like they just get in their ass about like they take it way too personal yeah agreed and look as someone who was formerly a bit in an anxious space i gotta tell you like when you release a lot of that personalization you feel a lot better because you realize yeah. oh it's uh, okay anyways first question for you is um and we'll just do this as like a rapid spitfire why does an ex-avoidant partner reappear and want to keep in touch with you even though they were the one who abruptly cut you out of their life? He doesn't want you as a partner, but he wants you present in his life. What are your thoughts on that? Um, because of somebody who's done that before. Uh, um, yeah, well, again, like we're just not very open. And I think that when you have a, when, when, when an avoidant does that, it's likely them saying like, I want to open up to you. I just am nervous and I don't know how you'll respond. Or sometimes it is like, you know, I just want you around and I don't know how to vocalize that. I think either way, or they just want to kind of keep you in and keep you around them. Um, but if it hurts you too much, then, you know, you can obviously remove them or you could block them or whatever. Um, if you feel like, you know, they're invading your space or whatever. Uh, but most of the time it's because of lack of expressing emotions and really being vulnerable and yeah just still wanting to kind of have a piece of you but not be fully open and vulnerable and it's not that they don't want you or they don't a lot of it is that they're scared it's just like if they've been rejected a lot which is probably what happened to them they were open and vulnerable probably with multiple people in their lifetime and they just want to keep you around and they, they don't know how to do that because essentially avoiding people do really care um unless they're narcissistic i can't speak for those people but for me i really have cared uh, <laughs> but the times that i did want somebody it was mostly because um and i didn't speak up on it you know so i was just scared <laughs> that's pretty, pretty consistent with what i've gathered too so i think yeah. Same page there. Great answer, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. The next question I've got here is, do secure attachers exhibit anxious attachment with severe dismissive avoidance? I'm going to answer this one. Yes. Um, I can tell you that as someone who's more in their secure spot now, when I'm with someone who's like severe in their avoidant attachment, I can feel it at a cellular level. And I already can start to feel myself fantasizing about someone and also just like getting way too addicted to the idea of the relationship before it's even started. And that's my cue to be like, okay, time to do some inner work now and start like de-pedestaling this person immediately because that's not healthy. And no. the point simply is your body will know. Like you're like, it's one of those things where 
if you're more wired from those kind of experiences, you know, you're, you're still going to carry some of those scars with you, no matter how much healing you do on yourself, but you become more aware of your body's cues to that sort of stuff. And you're like, Oh, okay. I know what I'm involved with now. So yeah. you can also helps you get back to that more secure space. And also to Tyson's point that he was saying earlier, when you are in that more anxious space, you stop putting in so much fuel and energy into the fantasy and you start to step back and see it for what it really is and accept the person for who they really are, which is healthy. Because if you're being, if you're in that more secure space, you don't care if they come and go. When you're in that anxious space, you're, you feel like your life depends on that person being there and you'll do anything to make sure that they're still there with you. But the minute you let go and just accept them for who they are, and by let go, I mean sort of like emotionally detach yourself from that yeah. experience everything feels so much better because it doesn't mean you you don't care about that person anymore but you're just not attached to them and it just means you're just like okay i can chill now and just and this person could do whatever they want and if they really care about it they will show me that they want to obviously pursue and care about it if they don't i'm going to read it as read and not try and invest myself further in this so that's my answer to that one um yeah. i was gonna say tyson did you want to add anything to that the only thing I had to add was like, I mean, I've been there too, where I've had somebody that, you know, it could be someone that likes cute on Instagram and I could be like, oh, you know, they're cute, whatever. I had a crush on them, whatever, whatever. And then, you know, I've created fantasies as much as everybody else has. Um, but I do understand at the same time, it's, it's just like, you know, you have to really, if you're giving so much, much of that mental energy or emotional energy towards somebody that really hasn't shown you much, it's just like, again, like I think a self-respect thing, like, you can go and have, you can just go and do whatever you want to do in your own life. Like, don't focus on one person for forever, you know? hundred billion. Like, there are so many people you can meet out here. You can literally go out to the store and meet somebody and have a great conversation. Not saying it's going to turn into anything, but at least, you know, you can be able to have a conversation and, and get your mind off of other things than just, like, that one person. Because I promise you, like, people are not thinking or caring caring as much as you think they are. And I had to learn that. Yeah. And I had to learn that too. And, and you I can block people too. <laughs> you can do that as well. If somebody's bothering you, I've done that. Like if somebody was, if I was infatuated about someone for way too long, I would just block them or I would just like mute them or I would just like, because I'm not going to give that much energy and that much time to that. And like they say, out of mind, out of sight. So I feel like if I'm clicking you out of my mind, then you know, I feel like you just got to move on. Now, that's only if it gets super severe. That only happened probably like twice in my life. But for the most part, I'm just kind of like, eh, move on, you know? I, it's funny you should say that because I've never gotten to a stage where I've been that infatuated that I've cut someone off quite like that. But it's it's funny you should mention that because I could imagine yeah. someone... Because I could imagine, though, like there's some people who have got that, you know, that avoidancy. Because I think for a lot of people who are in their avoidant attachment, they're very highly sensitive to their emotions because a lot of them haven't felt those emotions yet. Yeah. So I could imagine if it's getting in the way of your, you know, higher cognitive functioning, I could imagine you just being like, fuck this, boom, bye. I don't want to deal with this anymore. But for many anxious attachers and people who have like symptoms of love addiction, they struggle to do that because oh. they make the person their drug and they want to hold on to it. But anyways, going to another question, um, <laughs> do avoidant people come back and apologize or realize they've hurt some people? I've had really hurtful experiences. Tyson, what is your answer on this? <laughs> Um, I, I do believe so. If 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 that person is like self aware, you know, if if they're if they're self aware enough to realize they did something wrong, then you know they'll apologize. The only thing is, is that will their actions actually change? Um, because a lot of it is it's easy to apologize, but so much of avoidance behaviors are very um sub conscious and it's like it's just a pattern that's kept us safe for so long so it's easy for us to kind of fall back into the same thing from an unconscious perspective or space um so i think i mean they might mean it but i feel like it all just comes down to action you know because i had many times where i was like oh no i won't you know do that again or i'm sorry whatever and you know i just didn't know no better i just kept doing the same thing you know um and uh yeah once i got sick and tired of my own shit that's kind of when i changed you know <laughs> it wasn't easy it still isn't easy so yeah 
I've noticed that some avoidant attaches when they have broken up with someone they cared about, but then shut down and broke up. Oh, some of them can come back to you like the next day. Other people can come back to you months or years down the line when their emotions hit them like a truck. And those that are really working on themselves may come back around and just be like, I really fucking did something terrible to you. And I'm so yeah. sorry I'm looking to rekindle the relationship. They're more just looking to say, I am really sorry about that. There will be some I've noticed who almost just like trauma dump on you and be like, I'm so sorry that I did all of this stuff to you. Expecting you to apologize, like to like, you know, to almost um, give absolution for their behavior. Mm -hmm. They're almost like expecting their partner to forgive them for their stuff. And in that particular case, what the avoidant partner is actually looking to do there is to not take ownership and responsibility for their behavior. Right. They're expecting their partner yeah. to like, I forgive you. And it doesn't work like that, yeah. you know, for an, and often at times, one of the best things you can actually do for that avoidant, if they come back around and are looking for forgiveness is actually to deny it because you don't owe them anything at the end of the day, that forgiveness you actually owe for yourself. If you're not at a point where you actually can forgive that person and they're coming to you being like, I just need you to apologize, sorry, to forgive me for what I did, you know, you can actually just let them sit in that shit for a bit because allowing them to sit with the pain of what they caused you may actually be the very thing that causes them to wake up and be like, to I have grow, to yeah. So just, just going to put that one out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> got another question. Um, so do, how do I get an avoidant partner to go to, oh, how do I get an avoidant partner to go to therapy? He says he will and wants to, but keeps on delaying and shuts down conversations about it. Well, well you know, I'll say this. There are some avoidant people that do go to therapy, but they don't, they don't listen. They just do it just to kind of be like, see, I came here and I did it. And, you know, now I'm better. I think that depending again on the certain type of, of avoidant, you have to just, just see it for what it is. Yeah. I think that there's a difference between people actually wanting to go and get help because the, the problem is most people who go to therapy, they usually go for like, like something traumatic or something, you know, they have anxiety or they're depressed or whatever. And especially if you're working with like cognitive behavioral therapy, mm. it has to do with like a lot of like your subconscious and your patterns and your behavior. Uh, you're gonna figure out some things or if you have a specific therapist like mine, she was very like direct and very like, and I, I asked for someone like that. Um, I, I wanted to pray to have a person who would come into my life and who would tell me like it is because all of my friends are like that. I, I don't have friends who are yes men. Um, my friends will be cool and kiki with me, but they'll tell me like, bitch, you was wrong. So, you know, and it's like, you need to change something. So I feel like if he's going to therapy and he says that he will change or he, it's all in the action. It's, it is how much you, you really want it as a person. It's like, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, I want to change, but then you trigger it again and then you start acting the same way you was acting before. So you're not really being subconscious of yourself, you know, um, doing the same thing. So for example, if he says he's going to therapy and y'all have like an argument and, you know, he's still reacting the same way, then, you know, nothing's changing. However, if y'all are having a disagreement and maybe you see him like take some breaths you see him kind of like, you know, calm himself down and maybe begin to ask questions, you know, to be curious about what you're, you know, saying. And he's not doing this out of trying to like gaslight you or do some weird shit. He's really like wanting to understand you. Then yeah, he is trying. He is making an effort. Um, but again, you know, that just has to go with uh, with who you are, you know, as a person. But a lot of a lot of people who have these dismissive avoidance, I mean it it, it really takes like a real strong person and you wanting to actually change, you know, your life. I wanted to leave d being dismissive and being avoidant because I just wanted to be nicer to myself. I wanted to be kinder to myself because I was, I hated my personality and I hated my, uh, I hated how other partners could express their emotions and I couldn't, and they were more in touch with themselves and I wasn't. I, I was really mean um, because my own emotions were heard so that's why I went but other people you know I don't, I don't know I will say just to add to what you've said which I agree with everything <laughs> is that a lot of avoidant attachers will just tell you what they want you to hear they have grown up being very good people pleasers because if they've had like overbearing mothers and fathers 
you know, being demanding and needy to them, it's so much easier to learn to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do the thing and never actually do it. So please bear in mind exactly what Tyson's saying. Actions will, in this case, speak louder than words. If they're actually going and they're committing, fantastic. But many of them will go to do lip service. Some of them will go for adjacent reasons like ADHD, depression, anxiety, but not because of their avoidant attachment. Some clinicians don't even know what avoidant attachment really is and how it manifests and how it also relates to the ADHD, depression and anxiety that might be going on too. So please bear in mind that what you see is what you get in a lot of these cases and a proposal to go yeah. doesn't mean jack shit at the end of the day. And I mean, sometimes, sometimes like, they'll think that they're changing and they're not. You know, my father is a deep, very deep avoidance missive. Um, and he's very intensely, he reacts to, you can ask him a question and he'll get defensive about that if you don't know what it is. And as a child, it was very, I don't know what I'm going to get, you know? And so there would be these times where he would play like, you know, he would almost have this kind of mask. Like he would play this personality of like, oh yes, it's all cool. And I could be great with him now. It could be great. And then literally five minutes later, he could be like, you know, I could hurt myself in some type of way. We get off the floor. You're being ridiculous. Da, da, da. And so it was like, you know, I had to learn that I was becoming that. And so I, you know, space myself out from people like that because I can be cordial and cool with you. But a lot of the times when you have people who are dismissive, avoidant, they probably grew up like that. Um, and they probably had parents like that, or they just went to school and they got really rejected at school and they grew up and said, no one likes me, no one loves me, no one cares. So why the fuck would I care about this person and care about that person? You know, and so that's what it was like with me, you know. I um, cared about you know my dad and my parents and different people so much, but when they rejected me, even though I still accepted them, unconsciously I got older and I said, well, fuck you and fuck you and I hate you. And I started to be very, very angry. And so wanting to heal yourself is, as an avoidant person is really about wanting it for yourself. Like I hated watching what was around me and I wanted to have a better life for me. So I don't know about other, you know, avoidance and dismissiveness and narcissism and whatever they got going on. But me, I just knew that I didn't like the way that I treated people. And I felt like I was never really in a loving relationship. I feel like I was always just having pretty arm candy around me. And I just kind of stayed in the relationship because I genuinely cared for the person. I wanted the person to do better, but I don't, I was not emotionally open. I did not really, I don't feel like I was as present or available as I could have been. Yeah. Yeah. He love everything you had to say on that. And I, <laughs> and I was going to say yes to everything. Uh, there was one other question that I was going to throw in there too. By the way, just out of respect to you, how much time do you have left? Well, I'm good. I'm, I'm, there's no time. I was going to say, I probably need to run in the next 15 minutes, but I can probably get through a few more questions. How about we do that? Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So on the last, sorry, on the note of what you um, just shared with me, Tyson, another great question that I got here was uh, addressed to you. Do you ever ignore emotional messages because it's too difficult to respond? If so, what is difficult about it and what's going on for you when that happens? That's a good question. Um, Multiple questions. Yeah, that's a good question. I feel like emotionally now, uh, first of all, I'm able to listen. Um, that was something that was a big, big thing with me. Um, I wasn't able to listen at one point in relationships in general, um, especially with men, again, who were much more emotional. Um, I feel like one of the best ways to, for me, is just like processing what is going on and listening. Uh, it is challenging, though, because a lot of dismissive avoidance they weren't taught how to regulate emotion. So a lot of time emotion is more like a, it's more like a threat because it's so intense. And it, it just, you know, we don't really know how to, how to, how to, how to, how to talk, you know? Um, because if we weren't, you know, told like, you know, feel your emotions, you know, let it pass through and all these other things, if a lot of your emotions emotions growing up was told, no, you can't respond like that, you know, and then you're crying and bawling and you're watching people around you respond to you in a very non, you know, caring way, you know, you're going to think that that shit is normal. 
And so, you know, there's not going to be any need for you to really express what's going on. So much so that a lot of avoidance for myself, you know, I'd feel something like anger or, you know, I would be sad about something and I would just kind of be like, okay, I'm sad. I feel sad, but I don't want to sit and talk about this. I just want to get to work. So I would hit my laptop and I, you know, a lot of my coping was like through action, through doing, 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 you know, because that was my life. Like most of my life life was you get up, you know, at seven, you go to school from eight, you got football practice that ends at seven. And that was my, my life for years since I was five. And so I was barely home. I wasn't one of those kids that came home after school and played video games. That was like once in the every blue moon. Um, and so I feel like when you're constantly going, you're constantly going, you have all that shit going on. You don't have time to really listen to your emotions. No one's teaching you that you're constantly busy. So it's like, I felt like, you know, uh, emotional wise, when I did graduate and I came home last year, um, everything was like taken away. I didn't have a job. Um, uh, there were many times where I was like in complete solitude. I would have to stay in this room and just, I didn't understand why I wasn't like clicking with the people in my house. And it was a lot of stuff going on. Um, but I realized that I, I had relied on, you know, the material world for so long. I was so used to like, you know, I graduated high school, I got to college, I, you know, was all in all these organizations. I kept myself busy. So when it came to being in a relationship and opening up, that was not an easy thing to do at all. Um, and it, it was quite scary because it was like, if I really am vulnerable with this person, you know, uh, um, how is that going to feel? You know, I, I felt like I was losing a sense of independence. I felt like I was losing a sense of my own self. Like we had talked about moving in together and I had for the longest time was like, you know, I, I don't want to sleep with you. I want to be in my own room. I want to have my own bed. I, it was everything was like trying to divide myself from this person. Because to me, it was like, I'm going to lose. I'm going to poke. I'm going to be too involved in this relationship to where my outside achievements weren't going to be facilitated or fixed or whatever. or weren't going to be achieved. And that was a big thing for me until I realized that that shit really didn't matter. That does not matter. Um, it's fun. It's cool. It's exciting. But again, like kind of going back to that sense of self-respect, like, you know, I respect myself enough to know that I want to be open in relationships. And I want to be more loving. Today, I'm a little bit more, it's a, still a work in progress, but I can call my friends and tell them what's going on. You know, I'm still working on that, but I'm, I'm trying to understand that it's normal. It's healthy to actually express what's going on. Um, yeah. Completely agree. That <laughs> makes sense that, you know, you would probably feel just like, I don't have the bandwidth to actually, you know, hold space for someone's emotions right now if you couldn't even hold on to your own because it's just like, you don't like, understand it. It's like, it's like, it's like learning a, a foreign language. Like, you know, I would have like my partner, he had told me, or my former partner, he told me that, yeah, you know, you know, I want you to hold space for me and I want to be able to like free, he would use all these like emotional words. And I would just be like, can you just shut up? Like I, I was just in my head, I would say that, but I was just so agitated by his freedom of expression. It, it was, it was very, very rude. Um, but it, it, it's what I was used to. I mean, I, I saw people react like that. So not saying that I have to, you know, be that. But it, it was a challenge for me to, um, you know, open up. And towards the end, I got a lot, I got a whole lot better. Um, and it became normal, you know, when we would talk about these things, whether in person or on the or FaceTime or whatever. Um, it, was, it was easier uh, versus before, where I was very reactive. I started seeing him as a human um, and as a person rather than just like, you know, some type of object or playing some role. And then I don't want anything else to do with the rest of your internal dialogue or emotion yeah yeah no i love oh, that thank you so much I did. someone said it's nice to hear no someone said it's nice to hear this uh from you seriously i hope most um more most or more avoidance understand that i appreciate that it's not easy but it, it takes it's i'm sick of being the person that i was so <laughs> time for a change 
that's usually how it works, uh, especially yeah, for right. people too. Um, yeah. I have another last couple of questions for you too. So this is a great one and it's a very simple question. Signs and avoidant cares. Well, again, I can only speak for myself. Um, I would say, first of all, uh, an action. I I'm one of those people that I take a lot of action with things that I care about. So, um, you know, uh, some people with gifts, you know, some people like to, you know, murmur and avoid an anxious person with a bunch of gifts. They like to give them all these things that they ever had before. I wasn't really like that, but I know one of my exes, he, after he dated me, he dated somebody that was avoidant as well. And that was kind of a weird situation that he was like giving him all these things that he never had before. I know for me, um, I'm just someone that I'm going to you know, text you more. I'm going to call you more. I'm going to be very assertive and like direct with like, hey, I want you. Um, and that's one thing I'm very good at with anything in life. But I realized that when, again, the emotions became too much, you know, it was like, you know, hey, like this makes me either uncomfortable. And then, of course, they would feel some type of way because they'd be like, okay, well, you're not allowing me to be free and express myself emotionally. Um, but, you know, I, I still cared. I just, in that time, I didn't know how to uh, express that. I mean, I, I showed everything that I could, but I didn't know how to express it. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know for a lot of um, avoidant people, like it's what I tell my clients is this, you know, someone can care for you, but their capacity to demonstrate that care could be really crap. Meaning that, right. you know, someone can be like, no, no, I really like and respect this person, but they're not answering your messages. They're not contacting you consistently. They're not showing you any words of affirmation. You know, we have to remember, based on what you've also said, Tyson, too, like, especially with the care that you were probably, you know, maybe sh not showing yourself or showing others, like, if you've been taught not to emote, then you can cognitively be like, oh, yeah, no, I like this person, but you may not be doing anything more to actually yeah. show that. Uh, Some avoidant yeah. attaches, you know, they could be broken up with you, but still flirting with you. And you could be like, but this is so confusing because now their actions are confusing as well, too, because I've one minute too. they're saying to me, like, yeah. I don't want to be in a relationship with you, but now they're still holding my hands, sleeping with me is still, I'm really confused as to what they, what's actually going on. And what I often have to tell my clients is like, no, no, they care, but their capacity to be with you romantically yeah. is not existent. And that's why you kind of have to make those decisions and that kind of like sense of discernment. Like, you know, if you want to keep dealing with someone like this, then, then you do. Um, yeah, you know, I've I've definitely been there where I was I was very flirtatious, even though I didn't want anything serious. Um, I think it's just one of those like kind of I don't know how to express my feelings to you, but I'm gonna say it in these different ways. Um, and I think again, like that's where you can kind of choose. Like, well, I don't deserve that. I want someone that is it's very clear you know, uh, to me, what you want, and to be very open. Um, so I think that also comes with just being vulnerable and being open. I think like the avoidance have to get to a space where it's like, hey, uh, I don't really want this to be a relationship, but I want, you know, whatever, friends of benefits or whatever you want to call it. Um, that's fine, too. I noticed even when I was in, um, you know, somebody that like I was interested in messing around with, um, you know, I, I can, I can kind of sense when they're like not really into it. And I feel like, you know, you send a message and they don't respond for days or however long it's like, you know, some people, I think that when they're really into you, they'll be assertive about it. And then some people that aren't, they just aren't. I think the biggest thing though, is that you have to really like, again, like have a sense of self to, to, to choose and make decisions for what it is that you want. Like you really set the 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 game at the end of the day, you know. You 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 have to re recognize that you know nobody can really take advantage of you, or no one can really play you if you don't allow them to. You know, yes. it's like you have to kind of put your foot down, you know, in a sense. I completely agree. I think. <sighs> I also noticed this habit of some more anxiously inclined people to tell mm -hmm. their avoidant partner, please, can you just block me? As it, and it's just like handing all their power away to their avoidant partner. It's like, no, 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 no. 
it's not about them blocking you. It's about you learning to block them. Because at the end of yeah. the day, you being a love addict to this person, sorry to be quite direct, is actually not going to help you in any of this sort of experience at all too. Because you're not learning from the key lesson here, which is the fact that, you know, something, you have something inside of you that was attracted to this dynamic and that there yeah. is a lot going on beneath the surface too. And if you're, I get why people do this and I don't want to invalidate people who do this, but yeah. the fact of the matter remains, you, you know, that person, you know, if they're going through their, if they're struggling with their avoidancy, but yeah, sure, they could block you to be kind, but if they then have a moment where they're like, I still want to reach out and contact you, the cycle will continue. So at the end of the day, expecting the avoidant partner to hold on to your emotional baggage is not going to give you any sense of peace, let alone closure in a dynamic like that. So please, you know, the lesson for a lot of us people who are dating the avoidant attaches is to claim our but independence, responsibility and yeah. accountability back in these cases too. And it's up to the avoidant attach to learn how to open up with their emotions in these sort of situations too. So I think that- Sometimes that gives, that, that gives it time too, because it's like, you know, if you stop talking to the person who's avoidant, um, it, gives you, it gives you time to actually like, it's really like the, the anxious people, they tend to get so, uh, someone said closure here. That's definitely something that anxious people look for a lot. Oh, yeah. They look for some sense of like answer, you know, and it's like, I can't give you, you know, the answers of what you want. No. And I often find a lot of my clients, I'm like, yeah, you can, you not only can you find your own closure, but maybe you do need to go back to that avoidant partner to just like hash it out with them and realize their inability to give you closure is a form of closure. Cause it just makes you realize this is what it is. It's not, a, it's not about you. It's not about, you know, you're not being good enough. It's a case of, unfortunately, this is just what it is. You can either accept it for what it is or try and stick it out longer. But if it's only going to cause you more pain and frustration, I got to say, I personally prefer to not have pain and frustration in an ongoing experience with someone, especially if it's still a situationship and it hasn't turned into a relationship. Like if it's a relationship and there's a bit of pain and frustration, I'm willing to work on right. that. Right. Right. But if you're in a situationship with someone and they've, you know, made it clear that they don't want to take it past, you know, just anything more than something casual, you really are chasing a phantom at that time. Anyways, yeah. let's do one last question. So, uh, let's see here. Okay, Peter Kimbo asks, if your ex doesn't contact you, watches your story, sorry, doesn't contact you, doesn't watch your stories or like mm. your posts, and it's been six months, does that mean they're indifferent to you? They're obsessed with me in the beginning, then deactivated. What are your thoughts on that? And they're talking about this from like an anxious perspective? Presumably. So I guess to paint it in an example, let's just say I had been abruptly broken up with by someone who was obsessed mm -hmm. with me. And typically what we find is that a lot of avoidant attaches, what they'll do is they'll um they'll still in like they'll still like your posts on in, on social media, stalk your uh, your stories, sort of like what's the term? Haunt your socials for a little while. Yes, yes. Um but this person's saying a little bit differently that that haunting hasn't occurred. The person has just like dropped off, I think, from the face of the earth. Peter, if I've got that wrong and you're still here, please let me know. But that's the, I think that's what I'm getting from this. So in summary, if my partner was obsessed with me in the beginning, but isn't doing any of that, what am I to make of this? Um, he was obsessed with you in the beginning, is it now? I don't know, because it depends on the person. I feel like if the person is, if the person is truly invested in you and they really, you know, want you, and then all of a sudden they just stop. I think for me personally, I was not interested because the emotions was too much. And so I would become obsessed because I would like the kind of the fantasy around it. Like, you know, whatever, they looked good or, you know, whatever. We seemed like we worked really well because we had these things in common, but not really realizing, like, I wasn't really truly, truly into them. Um, so I think the obsession, though, like the watching the Instagram stories and going on pages and liking posts and stuff, I think that is just kind of like their way of, again, like not verbally expressing, but 
they want to, you know, still kind of get you around. Now, if they've just obsessed about you and then they just stop doing that, they probably have either like, if you've given them no fuel to their fire, you know, they probably are just like, let me go to the next person. It all just depends on the, on the relationship or the situation ship or who that person is as a person. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely experienced that. And I know strangers having done that myself. Like, I mean, uh, not as an avoidant attacher. Like, I mean, just to sort of explain, I know that I have had that happen to me. I truly believe mm -hmm. that person came to me in the beginning. And it doesn't mean that, and I know for a fact, because I bumped into them like much down, like later, yeah, English. Later down the line, they still look like, you know, they were obsessed with me, even though they weren't doing some of that action. So the thing is, kind of to Tyson's point, you know, it, for a lot of avoidant attachers, their interest in you can leak out in other ways that may not be traditional in the sense that they're not doing it right. through social media. But right. at the end of the day, like, it doesn't mean anything more than that. Like, it's like, it's basically a sign of, yeah, this person could still have, you know, interest and care for you. But again, going back to what I said earlier, their capacity to act on that and to yeah. work further on that is completely limited. And so Sometimes the things that you want, because there was even things that I wanted as a child uh, um, that, you know, my dad expressed that I didn't think was care or was actually being shown as love. Um, now I just accept it for what it is. And, you know, the man doesn't have it, <laughs> you know, and I think that's just the same thing with, um, I think that's just the same thing in general. Like, like, I feel like, if a man doesn't have it, a man just doesn't have it. And if a woman doesn't have it, a woman, because well, women can be avoidance too. So, you know, it's more common with men, but there are some women too. But I think it's just, you know, some people, they can give you gifts and that's their sense of appreciation. Um, and, but you want words of affirmation or you want receiving, or you don't want receiving gifts, you want quality time or, or you want directness and like, just tell me what you feel or what you're saying. And, you know, it's realizing that everybody doesn't have that. Um, and that's something that my partner was, you know, saying. He, he always was like, just tell me directly, just say it directly. And for me, I would, it was easier for me to say something through text than it was to say it out of my mouth in his face. Um, that was more nerve wracking for me at the time. Um, and, you know, he just, he would get upset because I wouldn't do that. But it's just like everybody has different ways of, I think wanting to be heard and loved. And I think that's why like reading something like the five love languages for me, just because I literally started reading that what two days ago, I feel like um, it, it put me on game to realizing that everybody does not receive love the same way. And so you have to learn how to like speak their language essentially. Um, so sometimes a guy's language is gonna be, he's gonna blow up your Instagram, you know, um, I know for me, I've had, like, I've sent a DM and then unsent it because I was a little bit scared. And so it's just like, everybody has different ways of saying things. Um, and I had a lot of times where I was just afraid of rejection. So I would be anxious in certain areas, you know, um, de depending on who it was sometimes, depending on, you know, uh, what the situation was. So everybody's different. Everybody is very different. And on that note, I'm going to um, wrap up our live <laughs> today. My phone also just told me that I'm on low battery now. So okay, yeah. I, can't I can't even afford to uh, keep the, the conversation going as much as I would love to. But Tyson, thank you so much for not only reaching out to me and wanting to do this live. It's so good to chat with you again about this stuff too. Yeah. To hear how much you've worked on this stuff too. And just for people who are interested, well, actually, respectfully for you, um, if you are open to people, you know, asking more about, you know, what you've been through and getting questions answered respectfully, obviously not trauma dumping on you, uh, where can people find you? Yeah. So my, like I said, my TikTok is the same name as my, um, my TikTok is the same name as my Instagram. Um, and on my TikTok, I talk about relationships um, and spirituality and authenticity and all of those three things. Um, and then on YouTube, uh, my name is the same well it's tyson's purpose but you can be able you can find that through my uh TikTok as well so all of them is literally my same name you just go to my instagram um you click on my link tree you can find my TikTok. but again TikTok, same thing as instagram 
And um, yeah, I do do one-on-one coaching as well. Um, I have an ebook as well. So I think there's, you know, just a couple of things that, um, you know, I put together that can help people. Uh, but yeah, most of my work is, is on TikTok as far as like relationships and stuff like that. Amazing. Yeah. Thing. Just wanted to throw that out there for everyone, just in case for you, Tyson, you get bombarded by a bunch of people being like, oh, <laughs> my ex did this to me and I'm trying oh to figure God. out if it's this. Which, by the way, I get why people do that. I've, I've gotten paragraphs. Huh? Yes, from TikTok. I said, I, I've gotten paragraphs on TikTok. I blew up a lot around the end of 2021 um, and on TikTok. And people will message me, women, I mean, men, I mean, it'll, they'll come to my Instagram and they'll blow me up with like paragraphs. Um, I've had like calls with people that like are crying and like, you know, it's all different types of stuff. I mean, it's a lot, but um, I mean, I get it. You know, people just want an outlet and people just want to be heard and uh, people do sometimes, you know, trauma dump. I think sometimes what people forget though, is that, you know, like for me, when I make videos, I don't teach people how to like get them back. You know what I mean? I, I teach you like, there's something that you had happened in childhood. This is why you react the way you do or something happened in your life. This is why you repeat this pattern and this is how you can then, you know, do the work to change it. Um, because I think often this work a lot of times with avoidant anxious is how can the anxious person stop doing what they're doing? And how can the avoidant person show me more attention? And I think it's, it's people are wanting to like, um, you know, manifest like that person back. Like when I hear videos about, you know, don't chase them and attract them and like, you know, get off your phone and leave them alone and like they'll come back and they get like that one text and that one call and they're so happy and giddy. Um, and then they realize that it's like a very temporary fade. And then they go, that person leaves again and they feel depleted and sad. And I've been like that, like waiting up all night, you know, for someone or, you know, I get a text or a call and I'm all giddy and excited and then they disappear again for like a week, three months, whatever. Um, and that really said everything about my own self-concept. And so what I teach people is, you know, how to not put their energy so much on being happy based off of somebody else um, yeah. and based off of a response from someone else and learning how to understand like, you know, essentially you're that you know man you're that bitch you're that guy whatever you want to use you know you are already that and and it's a form of disrespect when you put somebody else above yourself or you plead for love or you plead for somebody so much that you literally are like i'm not a human and i'm worthless and i don't mean anything yeah. so i kind of you know take people away from that yeah. which I think is a place where a lot of people can find a lot of peace and happiness. But just to round out, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. Tyson, thank you so much for your time and energy and also what you've shared. It's been absolutely, you know, eye-opening, I think not only for myself, but also for a lot of people here today too. This will become a video that I'm going to upload now and I'm sure Tyson will catch up again soon. But thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you too to your community and everybody. And thank you to everyone who said thank you, even if you left. Um, I appreciate it. So thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. Bye, everyone.